Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Martha Bickett. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of Surrey, and I'll be chairing today's CCAN webinar. Um, for anyone who hasn't joined us before, CCAN stands for the Centre for the Evaluation of Complexity Across the Nexus. CCAN is transforming the practice of policy evaluation to make it fit for a complex world. Our work started off with a particular focus on nexus issues, um, so the interlinked areas of food, energy, water and environment. But the methods and issues we've been exploring are relevant to a much wider range of policy areas, um, like innovation and public health too. If you want to find out more about what we've up to, what we've been up to, check out our website, ccan.ac.uk. So today's webinar is about Digital Catapult's work, treating innovation as a complex system and what that means for how to measure it. Our speakers are Brian McCauley and Therese Mikkel. Brian is the principal economist at Digital Catapult, where he works alongside academics and policy teams to better understand the diffusion and impacts of digital tech. And Teresa is an innovation partner at Digital Catapult, but we're lucky to be able to borrow her back today from the innovation team to hear more about the work that she did in her previous role, leading the development and implementation of the outcomes measurement framework in Brian's team. Um, Brian and Teresa will speak for about 40 minutes and we will um, have time for audience Q&A at the end. Uh, please do submit your questions via the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel um, and then I'll pose the questions at the end. There's also, I believe, a voting function. So if you see a question there that you like or that you would have asked, just give that a little uptick and I think that pushes it up to the top of my list. So um, do engage with that if you can. Um, the session will be recorded and it will be published on the CCAN website afterwards. Um, so no more from me. Um, I'm going to hand over to Brian and Teresa, over to you. Welcome. Yes, good afternoon. Well, there we go. Sorry, we, we, we get a bit of an echo here. So um, um, thank you, Martha, and thank you for colleagues at CCAN for the kind invitation to, to speak to you today. Um, uh, as I said, I'm Brian McGonagall, the Principal Economist here at Digital Catapult, and we're going to talk through some background to our, our work around um, innovation, um, particularly in the areas of disruptive deep technologies, but also what challenges that presents to us in terms of monitoring and evaluating the impact that digital catapult is actually having on both the economy and, and the wider sort of ecosystem. So we'll go through um, sort of four things. First is just give you a brief introduction to digital catapult if you're not familiar with the work that we do. And then secondly, I'll, I'll give you some background as to the approach that we're taking. And then I'll hand over to Teresa who will explain to you the work that we've done in terms of operationalizing the, um, the, the, the systems approach that, that we've adopted. So Digital Catapult. So we were established in 2013. We're currently one of nine catapults across the UK. There is a, going to be a sort of new catapult that revolves around agri-tech. Um, but our mission is to um, drive the business value that comes from um, accelerating advanced technology, adoption of advanced technologies. The main technology areas that we work with are artificial intelligence, machine learning, immersive, which includes virtual reality, augmented reality and haptics, but increasingly virtual production. Um, we work in the area of 5G, principally open RAN technologies. Um, and uh, other uh, technologies areas that we work with and building on are distributed ledger or blockchain uh, and increasingly the work around quantum and uh, nanophotonics and we're opening a large center in Belfast which is dedicated to exploring and advancing the use of digital twins. So um, why do we it sort of exist? I would say we were established in 2013. This followed the Hauser Review in 2010 that argued that the UK was lagging behind in terms of the translation of academic and, and new research ideas into commercial um, um, solutions and so forth. So Digital Catapult was set up and we do this by, by de-risking, so lowering the costs of adoption and, and, and innovation, coll increasing collaboration uh, across businesses and deepening and widening the ecosystem. And, and, and sort of so we're operating in the deep tech area. So it's basically pushing the boundaries uh, of, of technology through the, um, the technology readiness levels. So setting the context as to why we adopted this approach. Um, as I said, we work in the area of disrupted deep tech. So clearly the environment in which we operate in is very uncertain. 
and there are a lot of moving parts there's a lot of interconnections and connectedness and and clearly by enabling these technologies we can create properties or um, uh, the environment in which new technologies new applications and opportunities emerge so really we would see ourselves as a complex system we're part of the wider innovation ecosystem we drive that but when it comes to sort of monitoring this how do we operationalize a means by which we can um, uh, establish a system of monitoring pro prior to 2023 um, digital catapult was subject to magenta book um, uh, evaluations which are typical of the case but what we knew or argued is that the magenta book the approach taken only limited itself to the uh, direct benefits to companies that with which we worked. It didn't actually feed out in towards the, the wider ecosystem, the adoption and diffusion of technologies. So we had to make the case that we should be considered as a complex system. And we were backed up by, uh, let's just say, the testimonies of, of a couple of people who know a lot of things uh, in this area. Um, can you move on? I'm sorry. Um, so uh, as mentioned, the Hauser Review, in 2010 and then, and then Herman Hauser reviewed catapults in 2016 and then again there he articulated that you know um, policy interventions are operating within a complex system so highly interdependent multifaceted but more important to us from an air from a sort of advocacy base is um, Dame Ottoline Laser who is the uh, CEO of UKRI was giving evidence to uh, House of Lords uh, committee on, on catapults and she made this very very uh, important phrase from our perspective in the sense of saying that any of these complex systems that we're talking about in tracing their linear connection we are back to the seductive lure of linearity in systems that do not readily have linearity so we basically articulated back to uh, Innovate UK who are our, our main sponsors that you know the uh, higher um, senior team within uh, in UKRI were also reflecting that innovation operates in this, so therefore we should adopt a system that's more aligned to looking at complex systems. So my sort of final slide before I hand over to, to Teresa, uh, it's a bit slow in coming. There we go. So, so, so a, a sort of traditional evaluation would focus principally on the direct impacts that we have on the and, and the engaged firms, and that's generally done through surveying them through beneficiary survey case studies. We did a large scale piece of econometric work that actually looked at the benefits to, in terms of additionality, in terms of GVA and employment that the companies with which we worked generated, uh, as opposed to a control group. And there's other research that's been published subsequently to that that shows the wider economic impact that catapults are having both directly and also spatially around them but what we're interested in really is also incorporating the indirect benefits the the increased adoption of market entry creating competition sort of accelerating the innovation that comes about by having competition um reducing say those barriers to adoption that's one of our key points here to ensure that companies see the business case see the value of adopting these technologies and adopt them effectively so they don't just basically put this piece of digital equipment into their production or their businesses they actually know how to deploy it and how to utilize it effectively obviously again our, our, our role is to increase um, uk competitiveness so we have that there and again strengthen the technology there's a lot of fragmentation and diffusion around the technology ecosystem and brokers like innovative um, brokers like digital catapult are able to bring together these many many different facets of the innovation system and drive those forward in a more um, consistent way so i'm now going to pass over to Teresa, who will talk to you about how we have operationalized um, our approach to this thank you brian um, I'm going to talk to the, uh, about two of the different uh, tools, let's say, uh, that we have. One is the theory of change that I'm going to go into more detail now. And then the outcomes framework, which is the most operational uh, bit of our monitoring and evaluation approach. So what you can see here is this is uh, our first uh, theory of change, the first draft. We developed this with SICAN. Uh, they came here, did a couple of sessions, participatory ma uh, system mapping sessions, and then mapping interventions, and trying to understand the dynamics in the innovation ecosystem. Because um, like Ryan was saying, there are uh, many other elements that we also need to consider. It's not direct effect. We don't have a linear effect into the ecosystem, but actually there are many other elements that also affect things. So having a system approach allow us to see how the, these inter interdependencies uh, affect each other, how something can also have an influence even if we're not touching on it. Um, and yeah, overall, it's a good way to have this big picture. But theory of change normally 
they are developed and then uh, stuck in a in a drawer. So we wanted to take a more flexible approach, making sure that it's always ev uh, evolving, making sure that we don't get stuck in the beginning, but keep adapting as our theory uh, and also as our interventions adapt because digital catapult is very flexible and the innovation ecosystem is always changing. So we need to also be changing as well. Um, so here, I know this is a bit busy, but it's kind of the journey we've had uh, so far. So we started in June, July 2022 with the first draft that I just showed you, our system map and the theory of change. Uh, we did this with multiple stakeholders, both internally in Digital Catapult, but also some external partners uh, from Innovate UK and other departments as well making sure we would have this strategic tool, so a, a visual representation of how dynamics work. Uh, but then a year after implementing this, we did a review because, of course, uh, it was very great capturing the dynamics of the ecosystem, but we needed to make sure that it was actually working for Digital Catapult and our interventions. Uh, so in May, June 2023, we have a group from the uh, candidates for the Masters of Innovation and Public Purpose uh, at UCL trying to do a diagnosis, identify what are the opportunities for us to keep improving, to making sure it's contextualized to the work we're doing, but also how this aligns with the other tools uh, we have internally. I'm gonna present uh, shortly the other one, but making sure all of these things were aligned and built on top of each other. So we had a comprehensive portfolio approach and not individual silo tools. Uh, and also an usability assessment, so making sure that we were ready to use this kind of approaches. Um, so out of that work, we had a set of recommendations and a suggested roadmap uh, that involved, again, some consultations internally, is a lot of uh, literature review as well, making sure that we are following the best practices and the latest developments. Uh, and yeah, there was a, it was a very long list of recommendations uh, as, as any academic. Um, but then we did uh, stop then and do an improvement plan. So making sure we could align with our frameworks, with the others, but also we could prioritize this set of recommendations based on where we were uh, in terms of our work, uh, in terms of the development of our tools and other approaches, um, uh, making sure that it was aligned with how Digital Catapult was operation, uh, operating and the understanding. So we did that. And we launched the next uh, set of improvements in September, December 2023, so late last year. Um, we decided to make sure things are aligned, and you'll see this in a second. We chose to map the two tools through areas of support. So making sure that everything we do can cl be classified, and that is then mapped into the ecosystem, into the system map that you saw. And then making sure that we refine the, uh, the impact area. So wherever we're expecting to see changes, that would be aligned, again, in the different tools that we're using. So we reframe these impact areas from the original set that we got from SICAN. And then we had a pre preliminary set of areas of support that we're going to make sure that uh, every program, every project that we do is aligned to with. And then we did an, a set of internal interviews, uh, making sure that we were capturing the latest things uh, of our teams developing and delivering the programs. So working with different functions, understanding better the kind of support that we were doing uh, and the key areas that we needed to prioritize when making sure that we were capturing them in the theory of change, because of course uh, we do a lot and you can map absolutely everything. So out of that series of internal interviews, we got this uh, revised version of the areas of support. We had also validated that the impact areas that we were working with were the right ones and see how we could uh, use the uh, more than, it's more likely like how each area and, and their roles would help us achieve the impact that we were expecting. And finally, uh, we went back once again to our theory of change. Uh, we tried uh, to adapt the current one. Uh, we already had a good work, so we, didn't, we don't need to start from scratch. So making sure we could adapt the previous system map, the pure, uh, previous work, uh, also having a simplified version uh, by a, a Venn diagram, making sure that you could have a quick picture, but then if you needed to go into more detail, you could go as well. And this is still in development. Um, so it's not finished, but it is a useful tool. It helped us with the discussion, with having the strategy in mind and 
yeah, that's that's basically where we are right now. But uh, I've been mentioned a lot the outcomes framework because this is the operational tool, and we want to make sure that while the theory of change, which is more strategic, is aligned with the outcomes framework, we also want to make sure that each project can map their way up all the way to the theory of change. So as a summary, this is uh, our internal framework as we were working towards standardizing our approach to measuring the outcomes of the projects and programs, uh, making sure that it was established process, it was a standard, uh, capturing evidence in the same way across the different projects, making sure that it was robust, it was so consistent, and that we were following all the data points and we didn't miss out on opportunities. And this evidence could then fit different tools, different purposes, from helping us track impact stories to making sure that we have a data set that we can in the future consult to prove the work uh, that we've done. Um, so this framework consists, uh, well, I'll show a few tools in a few, in a few moments, but we have a taxonomy that is kind of the main structure that has four overarching themes. Uh, these uh, I'll show in a second, but go from innovation to social, economic, and environmental, trying to have this structure across everything so we make sure that we know the areas where we're working, but then concrete types are further defined that. So it's not innovation for innovation. Within innovation, we are keen to see how we're helping the technology development, what we're doing in terms of knowledge creation and collaboration opportunities, et cetera. And then to further define this and make sure that everything can be uh, can follow this structure. We have a set of over 30 metrics. So of course, each project will follow uh, specific metrics uh, that are adapted to them, but with standard ways of capturing the data. So you can compare in the future with, between different projects. Um, and, and something very important for us is to make sure that we use the right language and we definitely uh, separate the three things. So KPIs, it's gonna be monitoring how we are performing, but then we expect some outputs. Both of these are outside the framework and these are uh, monitored by other teams. So where the economics team came was around the outcomes framework, making sure that we were capturing what we enable via the projects and programs that we did but also we could build this data set that can help us in the future show the impact that we also uh, facilitated. And how we capture results concretely, uh, we go from the micro to the macro level. So in terms of micro level, we are capturing data at the organization level. So if we work in a short project with a cohort of companies, we are capturing each company's results and monitoring how this evolves. If it's one company, we have multiple points within that organization. So making sure that we have the journey they had with us. We can build these impact stories and we can see how they develop because many times they join multiple of our programs that we offer. And then we can aggregate these results and have the cohort or the project results. And this will help us improve our delivery. So making sure we know what we achieve in terms of short and mid term and uh, understanding, okay, if we are focused, as I said, with the main area of, the, uh, of support in investment, that's where we expect to see some outcomes. And then this is also aligned with our strategic outcomes. So uh, Digital Catapult has a set of strategic outcomes and we want to make sure that we can follow how each individual project and program is contributing towards those strategic outcomes. And finally, going back to our theory of change, we want to make sure that this can be mapped back and we can see the different dynamics that we were affecting in the system. And so this is the taxonomy. We have four themes, as I mentioned, innovation, economic, social, and environment, operational, and delivery. And then within each one, we have specific types. Uh, this help us understand how we are intervening in the space, but also help us be very uh, objective focused. So not measuring too many things, but it's just the ones that are relevant for the individual project. And um, so, because we also want to learn from this information, we have two set of, to classify the different projects. One is the type of project. So is it an accelerator program that we're offering in the experimentation area or more in the validation and proof of concept space or yet now um, other way to helping the companies grow and keep developing and scaling. But then we have also lots of programs focused on building an ecosystem that is open, that is that collaborates between each other uh, and, and well, we have many examples, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, and then in the, in the main area of support is because we want to make sure that we are following one specific target. 
we capture the main area. We know sometimes we will be touching on others as well, but this is the main outcome that we want to achieve for the program. So if there is only one thing that comes out, this is it. Um, more or less how it looks when we're implementing this. Uh, this is a process. We start all the way in the proposal space when we're thinking about what we want to do, what we want to achieve. And, and that space, we're going to create a set of strategic outcomes. We're going to choose the ones that we're targeting. So we have always that objective in mind. And then before we start the project, we're going to review, making sure we know which metrics we'll be following. Uh, we will agree on them beforehand. We are going to define the timelines for the data collection. And we were going to uh, develop all the forms that we're going to use to capture this data. And these are quite standard. We have templates. We have templates for the questions that we use as well, so making sure that whenever we talk about a specific metric, it means the same regardless of the program. And then through the delivery of the program, we will be collecting the data. Uh, we will have these forms. Uh, depends on the length, of course, how many data collection points we have. But basically, we will always collect at the beginning at the end, at the end to make sure we capture the baseline. But also, after the program ended, we're going to continue monitoring, gathering more information, because outcomes don't happen uh, right after the program. They take time to materialize. So we normally uh, monitor for 6 to 12 months after the program ended to start seeing some results. Um, so because all of this is a lot and the organization is, is big, it's growing fast, we, want to, we wanted to empower our teammates to follow this process on their own. Uh, so we develop a series of tools. I'm just going to show uh, one or two now. But basically, in terms of learning, we have a resource manual that explains the whole framework, what I've been talking about, how it goes aligned with the theory of change, but then also a handbook that is step by step. So if you want to engage, you take the handbook and you know what to do uh, with the different tools. And then to facilitate the metric selection, uh, and I'm going to show this in a second, we develop an air table, which is a collaborative tool that helps us choose and match and move around the different metrics, making sure that everyone involved in the program can contribute around this, uh, but also making sure that uh, in the economics team, we could support the delivery teams as they are thinking about this. because. Um, implementation takes time and we need to upskill and to and it takes time for this to become part of our ways of working. And finally, for the data collection, we wanted to standardize this. We didn't want to depend on one person. So we created uh, all the forms in Salesforce. So Salesforce is our CRM system and we use that to, uh, to capture all the data that we're doing. So we have the form templates and these are sent uh, in a scheduled way. So we don't need to be on top of things, we can program all of this at the beginning, making sure that we don't miss the journey. Because we know after the program ends, a lot happens, you start working on other programs, and we didn't want to miss the opportunity to keep capturing that data when it was the best time. So I'm going to switch now to the Airtable, um, just so you can see how it works. And this is just for the metric selection, just uh, by the way. So it's not going to be the final place. We have other areas, other spaces to capture the data afterwards. But I'm going to show an example of how you go about it, which is quite useful for internal purposes. So first of all, everyone who has a license can come and work. So everyone in the team can come. If they have any questions, they can leave comments, and you get notifications. So it's very easy and simple to use. And we collect a series of information. So from the project name, uh, the type of project, and many areas support, as I was saying, and the, uh, the project lead, because we want to have one person that will have the final say for accountability and responsibility uh, questions, um, and also making sure that the conversation develops naturally. And the objective, we always want to be objective driven, and we don't want to go over the place because it's very easy to be super ambitious and have too many objectives. Um, and then, as I said, you can here choose the different strategic outcomes. Everything is dropped down. And then you can choose the metrics that are relevant for your program. Uh, you just click on them. And if you change your mind, you can delete it. So it's very easy to use, very simple. And once the metric selection is ready, um, the teams just click here in the ready for review. And in the economics team, we'll get a notification automatically so we can go and support. So it's quite good, very easy to use. And you can see we have a series of programs already here. And then 
we have uh, standard questions because we want to make sure that when choosing a metric, you know what it means. So here we have the metric, the theme, the type, so it's easy to match to the other, uh, to the selection uh, tab, but also having what it measures, what it means, when would you like to choose that metrics, and then all the questions, so baseline, offboarding, if relevant, and monitoring questions. So we always monitor things in the same way. Additionally, uh, I mentioned the handbook and the, and the manual, so I'm going to quickly show. It is not too long, making sure that people can go through it, uh, but includes different things. So from the glossary, it includes the taxonomy, all the explanation of each thing, how to choose the different um, types or, or areas of support, the process, very uh, detailed, but also aligned to these digital catapults internal processes, making sure that this is not something that we added on top, but just an improvement of our current processes. And our repository, so in the air table, you can see all of the different projects that have been done before. You can filter that by type of support or area of, of support or type of project. So it is easy to see examples to, to draw inspiration if you don't know how to go about it. And then again, very specific step-by-step, step, how you choose how to go about it with definition explanations. Finally, we have a frequently asked questions sec uh, section because of course this is a new process that we are implementing. So it's very important to make sure that we can empower teams. Uh, the economics team is quite a small one. So we want to make sure that it, we are not a bottleneck, but things can progress nicely. Um, so that's the main presentation. I'm gonna stop now uh, the screen sharing and open the floor for questions. Thank you very much, Teresa and Brian. Um, all right, lovely. Well, we've got plenty of time for questions then. I'm really glad to see that we've got a few already in the Q&A box. Um, just a reminder to all the attendees, if you have questions, pop them into your Q&A box in your Zoom panel and or vote with a little thumbs up icon on the questions that you can see there. And I'll do my best to get through them. Um, so I'll start off with a question from Adam Stiles. Um, which is a question about the uh, resource intensity. Um, so how resource intensive is the monitoring system on the funded projects? And this is quite an interesting question because that's the trade-off with complexity is often around budgets. <laughs> so, sorry, it's muting over here. Um, the initial, um, uh, Sorry, okay. Um, the initial setup obviously required quite a lot of, of work. Um, so it was a dedicated project for, for Trace, but as you could see from her description, it's an inclusive process, which meant that we involved an, a significant number of other members of Digital Craft Board, principally in the innovation practice, consultancy arm within project management, um, uh, within the sort of um, so what we call a sort of um, operational project team as well, who, who, who look at the, the key performance indicators and how these would fit in. So initially through consultation, that was a, a lot of work. But once it's been operationalized, it technically has been devolved to the individual teams. So there's very little um, resource required from our end other than sense checking and ensuring that people are following the process. So... Um, like a Prince 2 process, it can be scaled for very small projects that might only be running for 80 to 100,000 pounds to projects that are running at 36 million pounds because the selections of the of the metrics and the objectives, and we will be realigning the way we articulate this in the future because we're changing the strategy and how we message or communicate the messages of what digital capital do. But, you know, it's a process of conversation, but once somebody has been shown how to do it, it is very simple for them to do. And we've created it through drop downs and through color coding. So that it's it's quite natural for people to be able to do it. So it isn't very resource intensive. As Teresa said, the economics team is small. It consists primarily me and of a, a insights and analytics manager um, who joined very recently, Josephina. Um, but, um, you know, we can't do everything, but you know, we've basically given people the tools to do it and we sense check it and make sure everything's done. And you'll also see there was a mention there that we maybe didn't mention explicitly is Project Gate. So a Project Gate report is basically the documentation that the project management team have to manage the project. So everything to do with the project is in there and included is the one page um, 
uh, summary of the outcomes metrics, uh, and that's included in that report. And any monitoring reports, the forms that go out via our CRM system, Salesforce, are all automated. So once the project has been started, then obviously the clock starts ticking for you know the period of the time and then once the project is concluded and the company has been offboarded then six months down the line they will automatically receive a monitoring form the only downside that we have i think that we could say is that the information comes in and it has to be extracted by hand or we have to extract it manually but we do want to automate this process to create a real-time dashboard so that when the responses from each monitoring form comes in they inform a dashboard and in real time that dashboard improves shows the direction of travel around these outcome metrics so long answers for a short question it's not that resource intensive once you've operationalized it but there is a requirement at the beginning to to, to build on people's time and resources thank you very much brian um, <clears throat> I've got a question here from uh, Paul Brand. Hi, Paul. Um, so his question is, can you give an example of something in the final theory of change that has its roots in the work to consider the system as complex and that can be traced back to the system map? Um, yes of course um so well first of all say uh, there is never a final theory of change because it's always evolving uh, we also showed a static version we're looking into a more dynamic version when you can move things around uh, but many of our of our big programs are really complex because they're not just about uh, multiple uh, stakeholders in the space um, i'm going to give my favorite example sonic labs um, which is a project I'm actually working on. Uh, so that involves multiple stakeholders, but also a lot of new dynamics that we don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, it's new technologies, but also um, it's it's something that it's changing the market dynamics. So a good a good example was okay. Let's understand what we're doing right now. We were working in the technology, trying to make it progress, but then we took this back to the theory of change, to the original system map, and see okay, what else needs to happen in order for this to keep growing and to uh, to make sure that we're making the progress that we want to make. Uh, so analyzing both the dynamics in terms of collaboration that we needed to build, that that connections in the ecosystem. Um, also, the collaboration, not just in terms of partnership, but also in knowledge development. So uh, connecting academia with the uh, research councils, um, the research we were doing, but also the practical uh, part of the vendors and the development internally, because we have a big tech team. So making sure that we had that, that big view uh, in mind. So we it, it's a collaboration, and, um, and it's not going to be one or the other. Uh, and the theory of change is going to give us the big narrative. So where are we going? What is the uh, economic discussion that we need to be having? And then we will fit that with information coming from the outcome framework, but also from the KPIs, from the dynamics that we're seeing, the impact stories that we're collecting, talking with the different people involved in the program. Um, so it is not that one will fit the other, but they go together and are constantly affecting each other. Okay. I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, yes. Um, but, uh, oh, if you can probably hear me. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to, to Teresa's mic over there. Um, so what you saw there was a static representation. And as Teresa said, it, it is an evolutionary process and it's always continually being considered. Um, what we do want to do is, is to incorporate this into a, an interactive visualization. So we want, you know, from, from a valuation perspective, in most cases, what will happen at the end of the process is that somebody will do a piece of analysis, that will go into a report, and then somebody will read that report, and then it'll sit on a dusty shelf for a number of years. What we want to have is a sort of interactive journey of what it is that we're, that we're doing. So you can move through the map, and, you know, I'm setting myself an ambition here, almost like little box pops pop up and say, oh, this is that, the other. So you, you, get, you get sort of inside, and it makes it a little bit more user-friendly, but the aim then is to show that although we embarked on this 2023, we're now in September 2024, October of 2024, uh, and already things are changing. And so our theory of change has to change to accommodate that. Even just the messaging, the way in which we map out the objectives into we deliver application areas, they will now map into uh, different communications like missions and so forth. So it's always changing. Um, well, by changing it's always evolving rather um with the aim of keeping it relevant but of course there will be legacy things that are coming out through the early stages um they build up the data that we need to ensure that we have sufficient evidence 
after five years to show the impact that digital platform is having um, on the wider innovation ecosystem and obviously meeting the requirements of our, our sponsors in the case of Innovate UK and DC. Thank you very much. Um, I also got a, uh, a thank you from Paul just to add an extra comment. Um, I thanks um, in response to Teresa's answer. I would love to see that example as a mini case study of how system informed theory of change works in practice for the team involved in it. And an interactive systems map and theory of change is the holy grail, Brian. So um, great thumbs up for, for doing that. We're, we're all looking forward. Um, all right, I am trying to balance the uh, the questions. We've got one here. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Ollie Kellens here. Um, so oh. the sort of um, a challenging one here, which is good, thoroughly encouraged. So Ollie says, you've noted the nonlinear causality of a complex system, but outlined an ordered systems map as an outcome from this project's work, which is a contradiction. I have only just been introduced to this work, but it feels like a statistical complex social system diagram would be more appropriate. Probable paths based on current strategic terms outlined by key parties with entropic details for likelihood to change paths with certain environmental events. I would be interested in a comment from Brian or a means to explore this work further. Thank you. Um, but then he adds, it was partly explained, uh, sorry, partly answered um, by mentioning of looking for dynamics. Um, and then he says, the question should focus on if the map can be self-organizing in its dynamic state based on environmental conditions entered by a user. Brian, do you have anything you'd like to say on that? I think it's been for the... Okay, so I'll I'll talking to talking to the experience of my friend. I, I did see this 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 come up, so I've had a bit of time to think about it. Um, and uh, maybe slightly more cop out answer to it in the sense that this one has to think about where this approach arrived from. So um, the first challenge that we had was persuading key stakeholders that this was an approach that had relevance, which is why we, we, I didn't give um, thanks to, to, to Martha and, and, and Nigel and James and Lau from CCAN, um, who helped us develop this proposal in the first instance. But the process was that we had to develop a proposal, which we submitted to Innovate UK, who had then a, uh, a group of academics and key stakeholders, which was the Catapult Impact Steering Committee. And like a PhD, I had to defend this. I had to say, this is an approach, this is why we're doing this little research. So we were having to uh, overcome some resistance, uh, some limited appreciation of the value of this in the first instance. So then, you know, the development systems back in conjunction with other people is one stage of that. And it's, it's really a representation of the, of the likely or possible interlinkages between the activities that we're doing um, and the sort of emerging outcomes and outputs. It's, 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 a, it's a far removed from a linear logic change in the sense that we could see the interconnections. I mean, it was mentioned that the, 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 the point impact theory committee, it was like, Brian, you are at pains, almost stretching every sinew not to use the word logic change. But we were arguing that each and every part of a logic chain is contained within our systems map. So it's not, it's not sort of a, the mention of probabilistic system, it really is a diagrammatic representation of the sort of interconnectivity, the fact that we can apply different time periods into this, some will come more quickly than others, some will be longer term, some outcomes may be achieved through multiple influences, some multiple influences will actually achieve one outcome. So it was it was there. The contradiction in terms of or the proposed idea that there's a contradiction to have a, 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 a structured data collection is we need to have that in order to have uh, a repository of data, data and evidence that we can then use to um, uh, analyze through a method. The proposed method that we have was a qualitative comparative analysis that we would do to demonstrate whether or not we laid out conditions to achieve success. So, you know, it, it had to have. Uh, a structured way, and again, for two reasons: one, to make sure the data is collected in a consistent and timely fashion, and two, you know, key stakeholders will look and think, "Brian, you're winging it. Why are you doing one that?" You know, it, they do need to see uh, data collection structure. They do need to see over time that data has been collected and what sort of data is available. So, um, I, I, I agree that probably in, in theory and in, in all those utopian sort of things, it should be a probabilistic map, but 
In reality, it's a data collection process um, uh, for the purposes of demonstrating impact. Sorry, that's a cop out. <laughs> No, that's great. Thank you, Brian. I think I just as as someone who was involved in this work um, with Digital Catapult, I would say that, um, uh, yes, we did. It is a um, ordered systems map, but I would be cautious about the word ordered there. Um, it's not it was certainly not intended to be and nor does it act as a linear um, uh, uh, sort of causality approach. It's got um, we we work from the ground up and doing the participatory systems mapping to look at all of the different possible interactions between all the various elements in the system. Um, and some of that uh, threw up things like positive feedback loops. So we were very um, sensitive to aware of um, and allowed those types of um, complex system dynamics to, um, to come to the front and to have a discussion about them using that systems map in that way. Um, and then when you're creating a a diagram trying to explain these things. There is, of course, a, a sort of way in which these things become a little more ordered. Um, but all of those um, complex uh, pathways uh, and feedback loops and things like that are still captured in that theory of change. Um, and uh, yes, so so it's there. And I'm really excited actually to hear about how um, Digital Catapult have been revisiting it and are planning to revisit it in the next year. Um, and continually update it because that is sort of best practice in the way that we at CCAN like to think of it for complex appropriate evaluation. Um, all right, thank you very much. Let's move on to this one. I'm interested in this one. Um, uh, this one's from Samantha Magni. Are you, uh, sorry, as you are an economics team, I am also curious to hear your reflections on whether the Green Book's focus on using financial metrics as a common language for comparing impacts sits comfortably with the Magenta Book Supplementary Guide on Handling Complexity in Policy Evaluation. Right, so this is where I have to be diplomatic as well, because um, ultimately um, it's outside my, my agreement to say, but um, uh, clearly sort of, you know, financial metrics have limited scope when we're looking at broader social, environmental, and wider economic issues. Um, we recently had conversations here about demonstrating value for money, um, which the conversations were very, um, uh, let's say, animated because we said it's really difficult to constrain all the things that we do into a standard ratio of how much money goes in and what is actually generated. And again, hopefully, from the, 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 the uh, systems or the sort of uh, diagram we showed earlier on, there's a lot of indirect benefits that may not necessarily be monetized in this way. I think there's a, a, a sort of misconception as well because. My understanding of something like an investment appraisal is it works if you're trying to build a bridge or something like that, where it's, there's, there's lots of engineers and things can measure the baselines and so on. When you're looking at something that's the evolution of organic or complex, then of course it's much more difficult to, to assign them in such a restrictive way. Um, but it's not for me to say to um, the Treasury uh, about Green Book. One of the things I would say in terms of the Magenta Book, the, 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 the supplement the colleagues at CCAM um, wrote, that was published in March 2020, greatly helped my argument in terms of us adopting this approach, because we could point out that this was actually government guidance that we were doing, and the methods that we were looking at and the tools that we were proposing were consistent with that, that, that book. But, you know, I look, we were referring to Green Book um, appraisals the other day, um, because as an economist, the rationale for market intervention. So starting off from a sort of like create or optimal and saying, well, actually, you deviate from that for this particular reason, be it you know, externality information, asymmetry of public goods. But you, you have to start and judge that rationale of that intervention from a philosophical construct that doesn't actually exist in reality. So you know that's in the Green Book, and it says they are a rarity, but we need to rethink that to say, well, maybe you know, looking at these things and justifying government interventions may need a broader range of arguments as opposed to just being the market failure criteria. Um, or the, the uh, project or program that we should adopt has the one with the highest return on investment, the greatest net present value. I think those, those are okay for certain narrow projects or engineering projects or large scale infrastructure projects, but when you look at interventions in complex areas like innovation, I think it's extremely difficult to apply those. That's my diplomatic. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, all right, we've got a couple of questions here around additionality. 
Um, so uh, we have an anonymous one here. Did the systems approach lead you to any new insights into how to capture the additionality of your support? Or has the focus been on what data metrics to collect and how to collect them? And then let me also just bring in James Darbish's question. Hello, James. James was involved in the work um, uh, with us on this. Um, so he says, how does one control for the counterfactual of what might have happened anyway? Government are rightly or wrongly interested in certain metrics like additionality and dead weight, which might be hard to estimate without a counterfactual, um, which a control group might help to identify in a more conventional approach. So um, just, just taking that, so we've developed the, the, the framework to allow us to explore the uh, indirect impacts and benefits of the derived, but we can have the same sort of data that we collect that to do a more traditional um, statistical analysis to look at additionality in, in that regard. Um, so I, I think there's a question in the, in the, in the chat there about the, I alluded to the econometric analysis that was done um, specifically for digital platform, that's not publicly available, but a broader uh, impact assessment or impact analysis was done by the Enterprise Research Center. Um, I can put a link into the chat if I'm able to. Um, but they did uh, an econometric analysis using propensity match scoring um, uh, for control group, and they're looking at the impact that catapults have had in terms of additionality around TVA jobs. We could do that in terms of estimating what the additionality and potential dead weight is in a more traditional approach. But the aim is to give us the scope to be able to do something more um, reflective of the, of the dynamicism of the organization and the impact they've had through um, a different method of assessing impact. I, I take James' point significantly about the counterfactual, but I mean, it, again, it, it's difficult to summarize in one way. If you sort of said, if digital capital didn't exist, what would happen? Well, you know, it's, we're even asking that question in terms of the, the, the support that we're having in terms of the technologies. So how, how do we know that what influence we're having on the trajectory of those technologies? Are we accelerating down the wrong line or are we, are we enabling the conditions to exist that then enable the technology to find the more uh, the most optimal route for them? So it's, it's difficult to define what the alternative universal fact will be, but we're trying to build into our system uh, an approach to collecting evidence, not just data, but broader evidence around insights and narratives that allow us to, to capture some of those issues that we may not have defined at the outset in terms of the metrics. And again, that will come through um, testimonies, it will come through case studies, it will come through the many different events that we have in collaboration with the innovation ecosystem, um, taking on board what they say, looking for insights and patterns that they might say that previously we have got. So again, I'm not sure if I've answered the question specifically as it's been asked, but it's, it, it is a challenge, it is something that um, we're looking to try to demonstrate we have a comprehensive collection of evidence to support demonstrating the impact as we can. And if I may add, uh, these are the standard tools. So as we were saying, we are empowering other teams to also help with the data collection, but uh, the team for specific projects or programs that are more complex uh, have dedicated time to support them and build that those other things, I, like Brian was saying, collect that other sources or types of evidence that can also help. So this is not the only things that uh, we're doing, but these are the standard ones uh, that we can develop more massively across all the projects. But when when it's needed or, or it's something more relevant, we will do something specifically for the project, for the program, to make sure that we're not just following this kind of structure metrics, but also having a broader view. Thank you. Um, let me take those ones off. Um, so, this. So, this is from Michael Ojo. Thanks for the presentation. What types of evaluation methods do you use for demonstrating the impact of projects given the complex system you work in? So, realist evaluation, Bayesian updating, etc. Well, let me put on my card. I'm not an evaluation expert in that regard. So, I would defer to, to people like Martha and Jane. So, I'm an economist. Um, my my uh, appreciation of economics is that it is an evolutionary process, it is not. Um, in an orthodox sense, predicated on an Newtonian dynamic. So, the, the, the many different models that you might allude to there in terms of evaluation, I'm afraid they're outside my scope of, of work. I have a lot more to, to, to understand around those to better inform, but 
recognizing that this aspect of the work is part of the job that the economics team does. So I, I can't answer that in terms of the specific realist evaluation. Sorry, I, I may, it may be something straightforward. Um, what we do do is that it's, it's, it's the standard mixed methods approach. So again, we collect quantitative data through this process that we've just outlined. That will be complemented by narratives, testimony, case studies. Again, as I said, we, we hold a number of events in which we have engagement with our wider innovation ecosystem, be the um, startups and scale-up companies with which we work, challenge owners, the large companies that have um, need for us to facilitate and collaborate with them, um, the broader policy environment as well, we, we do that. All of those things we take in and, and document and codify, which will then feed into our wider um, impact. But there's a lot of things that we do around uh, facilitating collaboration, facilitating networks, which are much harder to say, well, I'm gonna put a boundary on that, this is what I'm measuring. But we do need to show, because that's a key part of our work. Um, and you know, we, we have been working on a project with, with a, other partners around our, our UK telecommunications innovation network, which how do we demonstrate that that's having an impact when actually that it's, it's a network it's about coalescing and bringing together the many disparate um, companies within the telecommunications sector. It is, it's very difficult to put some sort of quantitative measure on that, but there are indicators that we are being successful in that regard. So. Um, sorry, Michael, if I've not so specifically said um, about the uh, actual models that we'll be doing, but we are using as much information that comes in through us uh, to demonstrate the impact that we're having in a comprehensive way. Um, and yes, I, Michael, I'd just point you uh, in the direction, well, uh, if you've read the supplementary guide to the Magenta book on handling um, complexity and policy evaluation, our view is that it's very much horses for courses. So it depends very much on the um, characteristics of complexity that you have in your system as to which method will work best. Um, there is no sort of one, uh, one size fits all approach uh, and it will almost certainly, in fact, I can't think of a single situation where it wouldn't be a mixed methods approach. Um, and so you can have a quick look in there where we've got the different um, some of the more complexity appropriate methods um, linked up, um, sort of contrasted with the complexity characteristics. And you can have a look at what we recommend for different situations. Um, so next question I'm going to pull out here, because uh, I think we've done a lot of these, um, is one from Beth Hogben. So how does this approach, which is really interesting, compare to the way other catapults measure the impact of their work on company innovation? So I, I didn't sort of mention this in the context side of things, but um, prior to, so the Catapults received their funding in five year um, funding rounds. Um, <clears throat> so Digital Catapults established in 2013. And so this is our third funding round. Um, between 2018 and 2023, uh, obviously there was a second funding round that was subject to um, uh, uh, a commissioned evaluation and, and David Legg is in the audience here and he's asked the question, but David was our lead uh, with Innovate UK uh, on this. Um, there, the approach was standard magenta book approach, but it came clear to me that this was not going to capture all of the impact. So um, I was the one that suggested that maybe other catapults were not happy with this, but that individual catapults should uh, propose and implement their own individual um, uh, approaches. So there are nine catapults, but there aren't nine distinct evaluations. A number of them did continue with the magenta book traditional approach of um, how they do things and reflecting their uh, impacts through the linear model. Um, others have, have broadened it to maybe take a more qualitative approach. Um, some have made their frameworks consistent with, say, for example, uh, research uh, excellence uh, assessments and so forth. So you know, I can't say exactly what each catapult is doing, but we each have responsibility for um, delivering our own uh, monitoring and evaluation frameworks. Everyone went through the same process of proposing their approach and then um, defending that approach uh, to the uh, catapult impact steering committee. All programs have been um, uh, accepted. We, as a cross catapult group, meet regularly to discuss with each other 
how we're going, some best practices that we might have done some teething problems. We worked again very closely more so than maybe we did before. Um, um, no fault of anybody, but we worked more closely with, with Innova UK in terms of the data collection, making really sure that we're all on track to deliver what we said that we deliver. In the time that we said we deliver it, we have a much stronger dialogue with uh, Department of Science and Innovation Technology. So we meet with them every six months to support, to discuss different areas. We are trying to build stronger links with the academic community. So I am fortunate to have good links with the community, but we want to have a broader catapult network of links with people like CCAM, the um, Productivity Institute, the Innovation Research Caucus, the Enterprise Research Centre, and other great research centres across the UK to bolster this. So we, you know, we, they, they, each catapult has their own framework which fits their approach to it. And again, you also have to think that with us, we work on average maybe 400, work on average with only 450, 500 companies a year. But if you're in the cell and gene therapy catapult, there aren't that number of companies. There's a small number of companies. The environment that you're working is very uh, different. Um, and so you need to uh, adapt your monitoring evaluation approach to fit your type, of, your type of approach to it. And again, we're as close to probably compound semiconductors and satellite applications as enabling catapults are probably similar to ours. But they may have adopted a, a more traditional approach. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go with this one next from David Legg, because um, I think it's an interesting one around uh, it brings together that uh, the practical issues of trying to draw a boundary around your system with the uh, important considerations when you're working with a complex system of having to consider all of the external linkages. So um, David says, are you assuming a closed system? i.e. focus is on support only from the digital catapult or a more open system whereby the business or project may receive wider support which also affects outcomes, e.g. multiple catapult support or catapult plus innovate UK grant funding. So um, it's not a closed system, but it's not a fully open system. Today we're aware that we can uh, identify whether our multiple sources of funding, certainly if they're cross catapult or if they're coming through uh, UKRI funding because we can match that data as we do um, into measuring the progress of the companies with which we are working because obviously the companies with which we're working we have the details of our company and we can therefore look and explore. We are doing a piece of work through Innovate UK to ensure that if there is any um, uh, companies that are working with multiple catapults we can identify who those companies are more for the purposes of ensuring that we don't all survey them or don't all approach them for evidence at the same time. But we can see which companies are actually receiving multiple support. Um, <clears throat> they're obviously getting uh, through um, looking at those companies um, insights into um, who they're talking to, um, where, where are they sort of collaborating. So again, there are different data sets that you can use that enable us to create network maps of the interconnectivity of our, of our companies. And again, we would take that into account of looking at the impact that we're having. Um, but as the operationalizing of the data collection um, has indicated, we do have to focus on the companies with which we work primarily. Um, but using identifiers, for example, like company house number, means that we can actually then look at other data sets that relate to that company and start to build up a more multivariate insight into that company and how that company may be linked to other um, other influences, other other sources. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, we have two minutes left, and I am going to be very cheeky and take the opportunity to ask the final question. Um, so you talked about the challenges. You've referred a couple of times to the challenges of making the case um, to treat innovation of complex, of of convincing stakeholders. Um, you obviously succeeded in convincing them to allow you to do your approach. Um, I was wondering, where do these stakeholders stand now? So have you won them over or would you say it's still a work in progress? Um, I think it's, it's still a work in progress, but I, I think as we'll know, with, with, with the new administration's approach to defining things in the context of missions, then we'll start to see that actually how do you, how do you apply the approach to measure the impact from those missions. And this was actually one of the first things that we that we did um, uh, a few years ago. So before the supplement was, was, was prepared and published by, by CCAN, we were talking to Bayes at that time about how do we sort of measure the impacts arising from these missions. So I think 
I think that as people start to look to see how they can start demonstrating that, they'll start to look at the language and the models and the frameworks that we've been talking about. So while I don't think we've, we've converted them, I think that they'll quickly realize that the value of adopting the approach that we have done to the missions and the broader uh, ecosystem will, will, will uh, be uh, effective. I think we, we, I think there are cycles. I mean, much of where I came to this systems approach was 10 years or so ago when um, we were developing models or frameworks for systems failures, the on systems failures. We were looking at the, the, the diagram of complex systems that was in our, our presentation was from 2014, the paper Terra Alice said. I think you know people start to realize now with AI, big data, and things like that, people start to realize that actually we need to move away from the sort of maybe standard causality, statistical model, and embrace more of these sort of um, multiple attributes that we can really find in things like complex maths or uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning will give us more deeper understanding of the impacts. So I don't think I've been successful in converting them, but I think the circumstances will be that are more open to our approach than maybe they would have been a few years ago. Fingers crossed. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, thank you, Brian and Teresa, from me and behalf of everyone listening um, for your time today and for the great webinar. Um, for everyone listening, we'll be putting the recording and slides up on our web website, ccan.ac.uk. Um, and that ends the that marks the end of our webinar today. So yeah, really huge thanks again to you, Brian and Teresa. Um, thanks to all of you listening who joined us today to take part. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.